Hello, my name is Jeroen van den Bos and welcome to different stages of writing research. Today I will be talking about the following elements. Um, these three are the main issues I will talk about. But I want to highlight first that this lecture is very much uh, the complementary lecture to the one on reading. So um, at one point it might be easier for you to actually watch that lection, uh, lecture first before you actually get to this one. If you think whatever, I'll I'll throw my bets, I'll throw my dice, I'll just go with it, uh, then enjoy and uh, like you can keep watching of course. Uh, so why do we write? That's one question. Um, in generally, it makes us more complex as human beings. Uh, it doesn't make them better human beings, it makes them more complex. Uh, so that, that's the reason why to invest, why to uh, practice this skill, this craft, this art. Uh, uh, and it can be fiction, non-fiction, doesn't matter. Uh, but today we will be talking about academic writing, so we will be talking about non-fiction. Um, there's a lot of stuff you actually have to unlearn uh, once you start writing at PhD level. Um, and even afterwards, if you move on from PhD level and you're functioning in the real academic world, uh, having a PhD as an independent researcher, there are even different uh, rules uh, and different expectations there. Um, the problem is, this meme is supposed to highlight that we are taught, if we are taught at all about how to write, uh, it's often with a lot of yeah, redundant tips and guidelines and rules that actually do not really apply. And these I will, yeah, I will boost these myths today and I will highlight some other elements. Yeah? But what I, do, what I do want to highlight is that writing in all its forms is uh, different for everybody. So there's no one size fits all. Uh, so this also you have to stay, uh, take into account. So what I will be explaining and showing today is more like an overview and then you find your own strategies within that. Uh. These are usually the questions that I ask my students in, in a class when, when I am teaching this. Um, and they mostly come up with the following issues. Uh, so like what is their problem right, uh, with writing? Most of them have problems starting to write. Others have uh, problems structuring what they're doing. Others don't know when to stop, when they should stop writing, when it's finished and so on. And others, yeah, they, they usually are out of time when it comes to editing and just send it through because they, they already uh, were writing at midnight, past midnight, just to get something due by the next day when it came to a writing piece. So these are the different issues. Uh, and I will highlight some of them. I won't have solutions for all of them. Uh, it's also part of time management, organizing and so on, which is not part of this video. But uh, at least when it comes to distinguishing between the different stages, uh, this should be useful. Yeah? So reading and writing, they really are yin-yang. So what we do while we're reading uh, and the different stages of reading, uh, we're actually trying to reverse engineer that while we're writing our own text. The thing is with writing, there are two logics here. There is the logic of putting our thoughts on paper and then making those thoughts available and clear for readers. So there's a there's a two-pronged approach there. Huh? You can do these different stages at different times, but uh, there is some uh, this we have to take into account. When we're reading, we're already reading finished products. We're reading books that have already been through these both stages and actually already products that are uh, meant to send us a message, information, and that hopefully change the way how we think. And how we engage with that? Well, this is explained in my video on the different stages of reading. And this actually shows what it is. So here we have the four different stages of reading, as I explained in my other video. So first, pigeonholing, x-raying, leveling with the author, and then the last level, the syntopical reading, hearing him or her out, going beyond the words of the author and trying to understand the meaning, the discourse, the limitations, the pitfalls, the biases, and all the other elements. And when we're writing, we're doing the same. So first we define a purpose. Uh, we have a topic, we have a question, we want to deal with that. This is how we're going to present our information, our ideas. And then we have to structure these in how are we going to give these to our readers. Then we start drafting, we actually start making text. And there's two, two versions to drafting. Uh, first drafting for ourselves and the second level of drafting in order to make it fit a formal structure. 
And then the final stage is revising and editing and make sure that everything works so it's all coherent so the reader actually can understand our message. So we can apply and, 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 and uh, tailor the form, uh, cater to the form into its uh, specifics and its nuances so the reader will actually understand what we are saying and what we're trying to say. Um, in general, these like thinking, making a draft and revision, these are always highlighted as the three stages of writing. Um, yeah, this is, this is too simple. Huh? Writing is, a, is a quite a complex project uh, process um, with different elements to it. Uh, it's different for a lot of people how they write, how they think. So dividing this simple does not really work. Uh, these things overlap. We mostly do all three of them uh, at s s overlapping times in our uh, um, organization uh, when we organize our writing projects. Uh. So uh, don't treat these three stages as stages. Eh? Treat them as more like three different purposes or three different uh, processes of the larger writing process. Eh? But they definitely overlap and interact. Eh? So that, that's, that's important to, to, to keep in mind. Eh? Traditionally, in high school, you would have learned the follow. First, you do your thinking. Then we do the, the writing, eh? making a drafting. And then you do the revision and then you send it in. That's not how it works. Uh, nobody does that. And the simple reason it doesn't work like that is because we, as scholars, we think through writing. So it's only when we're putting words to paper, and this is not an easy exercise, it's usually a painful process, that we can actually transform our thoughts into structures, linking them internally. Because in our head, we can keep everything in our head at the same time. It can all float around and it will make coherent sense. But it's when we have to write it down that we see the inconsistencies. Uh, we see that some things don't relate and we have to find the words to link these things. And it's only through writing that we can do that. Maybe the best of us can just like spit them out and, and, and have it ready, coherent and so on. Uh, maybe the great minds. But for average human beings, huh? um, like the writing process itself is necessary, is, is the key stage in which we actually transform our thinking into coherent thought and arguments. And so we cannot start writing we, uh, after our thinking. That doesn't work. We have to do these things at the same time. And even like, look at the, the third alternative visualization, which is also, you know, it's it's a... Um, it's a way to mix up the first two, uh, yeah, absurd approaches, right? Uh, uh, so uh, because it really overlaps. Uh, so it's through writing that we actually do our thinking. Uh, it will still be accompanied by more writing and drafting, and then the revision also starts, uh, pouring things into the final form and then actually finaling, finalizing our text to make it ready for the reader. Uh, this is a very simple, probably like. Depending on the writing piece that you're doing, uh, this process can be very long. Every chapter can have something like this. So this is, you know, like broad, raw theory here. Huh? But uh, it's by visualizing this, I hope that we can start thinking differently about these different stages as separate stages. Huh? That's the whole point of this. Huh? It's true that the first stage, thinking, huh? we do need to have a plan. Um, even thinking we do through writing. Huh? And for this, it's very it's very helpful that in the earlier stages, we actually do what we can call a statement of purpose. A statement of purpose is not the same as an abstract as you would find in a, in a research article or like uh, when you have a conference paper, you have an abstract of, of, of uh, what a certain lecture is going to be about. That's not really the same. It looks similar because it's short, it's only a couple paragraphs, but a statement of purpose is actually something you don't show anybody else. This is not a finished product. This is not something, this is not something that is, has been revised at the end of a thinking process. This is actually the first attempt to structure our thoughts and put them on paper or on screen. And it's only if you can write these things down and clarify your ideas and map them, and sort of mind mapping anything and, and really put them in sentences, that you know that you're actually onto something or you just need to think more. 
you're not ready to start writing if you're not able to make a statement of purpose. Right? So that, that's, that's why this is important to write this down, because it forces you to put your rudimentary first basic thoughts on paper before continuing uh, others. And this doing this early on will also, uh, of course, it ne needs to be reading before, but doing this in an early stage of the writing process as a whole will, force you to, uh, will give you more focus when you start uh, reading up on other materials and, and then structuring and drafting and so on. Uh, so the first stage, statement of purpose. Then the other element is a scratch outline. Uh, so this can be mind mapping, drawing. Uh, everybody's different, right? Uh, like I'm not gonna try with an example. This is still from my presentation from my students, uh, but um, keywords, concepts, some people doodle, some people uh, draw, some people mind map. Everybody's different here, uh, but um, might be like it can be very handy to start doing something like that and maybe use this first before you make a statement of purpose or um, first make a statement and then you work out the rest by a scratch outline so these are the early stages but we're already working with pen and paper mostly huh? so or like i are already typing stuff i were already filling uh, putting words on the screen huh? so um, once again writing is an inherent aspect of our thinking process while we are writing. The second element is crude drafting. And here crude drafting is important to separate drafting from uh, drafting and putting stuff in form. This crude drafting, we're not looking at the formal outlook of our paper or our chapter or our structure yet. So we don't care. We only structure and write down the, put pieces of text together uh, that makes sense for us in our head. We don't take into account that they might not balance out, that some part is too big, the other one is too small, uh, that they're disproportional, that, that uh, it's too long or too short. We don't care about any of that. Huh? Um, the best way to do is actually really close down everything else, have a wide screen and start writing any thought and don't stop. Uh, so accept imperfections, don't correct spelling mistakes. Uh, if you don't have an answer, just skip a line and, and write. It's not easy. Not everybody likes doing that. Uh, but I found, like, I actually personally had to force myself into doing this kind of work as well. But I do find it useful uh, to, to do it early on, especially if you're starting with a new chapter. And once you have some stuff and the ideas come to the paper and you already know what you want, but then you start writing the different elements, uh, the different branches of uh, a larger text, uh, like the skeleton is coming together and you just have to puzzle it in the right order afterwards. Uh, that's that's very useful just to write and don't stop. But it's hard to um, not go back and start correcting or editing at this level. Uh, so this uh, you have to keep in mind. The idea here is to develop your ideas, um, separate smaller ideas from big ideas, and work out a structure that works in your head, a logical structure. Afterwards, you can see how you're going to present it in a formal structure, but a logical structure for you at that point of writing. And once that's done, you can really start, just keep writing and updating that and that. And then we actually end up in the formal structure. And in the formal structure, you take this lump of text or pieces of segments and um, and you start, you force them in a straitjacket of your formal outlook. And here, of course, you need to know what is your writing project? Is it an essay? Is it a research paper? Is it a scholarly article? Is it a PhD? Is it a PhD chapter? So you need to know how large it is, how much space you have, how much research you need to do in order to fill in all the elements that you have put to paper. But um, so this is also like a comparing writing projects. Also a video I have on this um, that that um, compares these different writing projects and um, makes makes you critically assess what is expected of me and what's the purpose. So what's this, uh, or like keep that in, those elements in mind well when, when assessing your formal structure. So you know what's expected from you and what form it has to be. So then you can do your crude drafting and start pouring it in a formal outline. And that is actually when you do that and you start writing. Uh, you keep track of your word count, um, you start doing the backup research. Uh, so for instance, you know that you have to deal with this in this case because this, it makes sense that these are the cases that you chose by your initial reading, but then you will go back to your reading in order to uh, put all your sources of these cases together, compare them, um, start making new notes and actually filling in the blanks for your formal structure in order to write 
a certain segment of a text that, uh, that is supposed to be on that. Because especially with larger writing processes, you can't have all the data in your head. You cannot read everything and then say, now I'm going to write. It doesn't work. You write in order to structure your thoughts. Then you put it in a formal outlook and this is how it's supposed to look huh, for the reader. And then you fill in these things by going back to your literature, to your notes and filling these things out in the text. And then uh, we actually, the writing starts with focus drafting. Huh? So here we move on from, uh, so we have a, our crude ideas, our own logical structure. Huh? This was the crude drafting. Then the next thing is the formal structure. So we put in the structure you know, what is expected of us and how long it can be. We know or we uh, at least keep in mind that how long uh, certain subsections or subchapters can be. And then actually we do the focus drafting in making sure that we meet the word count and um, we, 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 we get the content in that's fully coherent and so on. Uh, in order to do that, we have to think in paragraphs. Yeah? And I'm going to take a little side break. I'm going to talk a little bit about paragraphs before going back to this slide and, uh, and then discussing this and the final stage, editing. Um, because paragraphs, there's a lot of there's separate books out there and a lot of materials on how to write a paragraph, what a paragraph is and so on. I'm only going to highlight the basics here. I do recommend you, if you're not really familiar with the tier behind your the ID behind a paragraph, that you actually look up more here. Uh, like I'm not going to do this, uh, that in these videos. There are people much smarter than me that were able to, to give you uh, uh, the theory of a paragraph and its purpose and how it should relate. Uh, but a couple words. Uh, so a paragraph is not a random group of sentences. Uh, it's an organized group of sentences uh, organized around a central topic. Uh, and when a reader reads a uh, paragraph, they have a clear path in order to get to the point, in order to get to the point of that um, that idea, that thought. And therefore, paragraphs have four elements. Uh, the four, uh, the first element is of course unity. Um, and this has been like, you can't have two large ideas in one paragraph. Usually a paragraph is quite a concise idea and you build up toward it to, to give it. So either you give the idea in the beginning and then you explain why, or you give your arguments and then you lead up to the idea and the idea is a conclusion. So that depends, but all centers in the paragraph have to be united across this idea. You can have like a side note and so on, but usually these things actually weaken your paragraph and it's better to put them in footnotes sometimes if you have like additional information or just leave it out if it just distracts you from the main idea and is not that relevant and not that important keep it out cut it out of the paragraph the second element is order so there are different ways of structuring your paragraphs and getting to the point you can use chronological order order of importance any other uh, um, form and structure that actually gets you to the main idea uh, so this is why i don't want to this is too specific and there are too many examples, huh? but uh, the order of your sentences is important and matters in order to uh, present your thoughts in such a way. Hmm? The other one is coherence. Huh? So they need, these sentences need to connect with one another. So this is where you use your connection words huh? and because, since, um, nevertheless, huh? uh, moreover, these are the words that connect the sentences within your paragraph and structurally connect them into one larger or one concise idea. And the last element is completeness. Huh? So all sentences need to support the main idea. Uh, and if you have sentences that have actually nothing to do with that, um, but they are important, they probably belong in a different paragraph and you probably need a couple extra sentences to lead up to the idea and actually get to the point without distracting the reader by giving them two conflicting ideas in one paragraph. Everybody writes like that. Every good piece of writing has clear paragraphs and you can actually really take a text and say that's this idea, that's this idea, that's this idea, and that's this idea if you go to the whole page. Another way of doing this, and this is something that that um, very few people do, but if you're still in your crude drafting, 
or at least in like a stage of formal drafting and you're trying to establish what should go where, you can actually take a piece of paper and divide it into three columns. And the first column, you just write your main ideas. In the middle column, you write your main ideas of how you want. And then you can have like one column, say the left column is zoom in, and the right column is zoom out. So you can give case-specific details in the left column that give you more clear examples of the main line of, line of argumentation that you're using. And the other one is zoom out, is context, the debates that they touch, uh, and these things. And you can actually also like visualize your paragraphs. And then each of these elements, being in the main column uh, or, or left or right, they all will become separate paragraphs uh, in one structured text. But this is a way to... Uh, link them together and see what are the main paragraphs, the main ideas, and how the others are supporting paragraphs in order to get my idea, uh, my, my ideas um, in a structured way to the reader. Huh? So that's another way of doing these things. Huh? So now we go back to the slides. Huh? So the, the second stage of writing, huh? focus drafting. So now we're really writing to finance our thought. We're uh, finishing, like we're completing our paragraphs where we're um, like updating them where we're making sure that they, they relate to one another you have introductory paragraphs you have concluding paragraphs you have uh, paragraphs that that uh, link um, the text blocks between different sections or subsections um, so all of this is uh, is the final stage of the focus drafting yeah? and then when this is done you actually have your thoughts on paper yeah? so you went from crude thoughts and drafting for yourself pouring these into an outline in a formal outline and then actually finalizing these thoughts working on the paragraphs and making sure that these are now ready for readers and the final stage is actually the fine tuning and this is the editing. And this is actually one of them. This is an equally important stage. So it's not all the thinking, all the drafting, and then the editing is just, you know, you do something at the end. This is actually very important because now you actually have to go back with your main purpose in mind and your uh, statement of purpose and the main ideas and the main message you want to convey and actually make sure that every paragraph, every subsection contributes to achieving this goal. Your goal is to change how people think about something. It's not saying, I think like this, it's how to change other people. In order to do that, you have to convince them and you have to keep their attention. In order to do that, you have to make sure that your argument remains clear throughout. There can be some dodgy paragraphs, there can be some side thoughts that you interview because you're personally, uh, you, you feel that this is necessary, this is your writing, this is important to you, that's fine. But the main text, and the main paragraphs all have to lead up in a coherent form of argumentation in order to get to your point. And if you can't do that, then people will give up on your reading. They don't mostly don't have to read it. Yeah? So the revising and the editing is a very important phase in order to make your text ready for the reader. Yeah? Um, the best way is actually to leave your if you have enough time and you do your time management well. The best thing you can do is actually after your text is drafted and it's fi your final draft is ready, let it lie for a while. Write something else, do other kinds of work, just let your text lie and then go back to it. Yeah? If you immediately go from the drafting phase to the editing phase, it might be difficult to, to see uh, through a reader's eyes what is missing, what can, be, um, what can be improved. And also you will be too attached to all the text that you just created. So it would be very hard to delete passages which are not that relevant, which can be altered, or switch things around and make sure that you change the order. You don't see these things if you're freshly out of um, the drafting. So it's better to take a break and then go get back to your text with a fresh pair of eyes. Um, these are the elements that you, sh you sh should keep in mind while uh, editing. Uh, so um, these are like checkup questions. Huh? Um, and if you do these and you reflect on these, a sort of checklist while you go through a chapter or uh, through the main text, especially to, to do this part by part, uh, they probably give you some ideas in how to change the text in its final form to make your thoughts even more clear. Um, 
Revision and form are very important in academia. Uh, this goes without saying. Uh, the thing is, we're used to certain schematics, and people also use these schematics. Huh? So, when it comes to titles, right, a title should have as few as per words possible, uh, at least for the English language, right? I'm not going to say anything about other languages, uh, uh, cultures differ and so on, but for English, at least, uh, uh, the title should be should have as few as words as possible. And if you don't give the right title, if you add words that are unnecessary, the title is what grabs your attention. And usually the summary of the abstract is what gets them in. Um, when it comes for research paper, when it comes to chapters, you actually need a kind of hook. You need to grab their attention somehow and make sure that you can show that this text is valuable to them. And you have to do this very early on. This has to be in your first paragraphs in order that a reader is invested, especially those that are not paid to read your text. So, the title, crucial. Uh, try out different titles, uh, uh, list, make a list and just toss them around, see what works, see what doesn't. If, if, if you uh, have colleagues um, that you can trust with this, give them a couple of titles and say which one would you choose for a research paper. Uh, you might be invested in a certain title because it has a nice pun, but if nobody gets the pun and only you, then there's no point of uh, pushing this one on your article and confusing readers with it, so they uh, it doesn't get to their uh, your text doesn't get to its target audience. Huh? Abstracts. There are also a lot of uh, guidelines in how to write abstracts and so on. Uh, here's are some guidelines that I, I will you can read on your own time. Like, but the goal of an abstract is for other readers to allow. It's, it's like in their reading phase. This is what they use as their main tool for pigeonholing your research article or your chapter. So they will read your abstract, your chapter abstract, your article abstract, uh, your book synopsis in order to decide if this is something that they need or not. And since they are, will be probably going through a lot of literature if they're gathering, they have to make these choices quite quickly. And nothing is such annoying that they start reading and after two chapters they find, no, this is not it. I've wasted my time. Okay. Also, even worse is probably that readers don't get it and it's too messy and they toss away your text even when it was useful and they would be able to sigh and they would benefit it from their research. So an abstract, these things you cannot rush. You write them and you make sure you come back to them of later time. You make sure there's no words, nothing that that's no abbreviations, no data that's unnecessary. The title and the abstract are one also, right? So if you have certain words or keywords in your title, you don't necessarily have to uh, repeat them right away in the abstract. That's not necessary. Your abstract is also not the same as the beginning of your introduction. So that's the first paragraph in introduction is not the same as your abstract. Your abstract should go a little bit beyond that and also highlight what the conclusions are going to be or what debates it touch. So an abstract is a mix of both your introduction, uh, your method, uh, some, some ideas on your methodology, methodology and uh, at least a sneak peek review of your conclusions. Huh? Keywords. Keywords is obvious, uh, you highlight the keywords, you often highlight the same keywords, but you don't have to highlight the exact same keywords as you already have written in your uh, title or in your abstract. For instance, if you don't have time uh, place in your abstract to highlight what debates are you working on or what methodological theories this is based on and how this relate, highlight these in your keywords. You can actually have a different tagging system in how your text actually um, connects with the larger debate, larger subdiscipline, and so on. So these keywords can be. There's no point in inventing your own keywords if they are like okay. You can say this is a keyword. Huh? This is my theory, and I'm launching as a new keyword. Huh? But you cannot invent every keyword because then people will not be able to relate this to anything else. Nobody will find this. Nobody will use these keywords. So it's better to relate them to, for instance, theories that you criticize, improve upon, use, base upon. Eh? So even if they're not listing your abstract, you can say this is where this relates to. Yeah? And this will make your text much more available. And also uh, probably a first choice because somebody reads your title and your abstract and say like, okay, I'm not sure yet, but then they read in the keywords that they 
this text connects to the stuff and the research that they're working on, then they will say, okay, I'll give it a try. I'll read it later when I do my reading. Hmm? Um, when it comes to the form of your research, like this is too simple, of course. Uh, so introduction, research, hypothesis, theory, methodology, and so on. This is clear. I'm not going to uh, talk about this so much, uh, but uh, at least not in this paper. Um, you can think about switching some of um, the elements here. Like some people, for instance, they will they love to make uh, to give the the uh, theory and the concepts first, and then get to the research questions. That is not always the best way to get readers' attention. If they want to know what why it's going to be relevant, you have to show them in what way you can benefit, uh, change the way how they're thinking. So like, this is how you're thinking. And with this, I will give you some value to think about this thing that you care about a little bit different, or mm, you missed something. Huh? So the different ways of doing that. Huh? Um, so depending how you're writing and what you're writing for, these things need to uh, can switch around. But this, of course, is just a form for like a research article. This is not like for chapters for a PhD. Uh, all of these different elements will become different parts of chapters. Huh? So formally, uh, this is just a general order. Huh? But, uh, um, also, everything that I said here, this is not dogma, right? You do what you do. Uh, you choose. It's best to try these different methods out and get familiar with them, but uh, you're not obliged to follow exactly this order. Maybe you're this kind of person that does your drafting in such a way that the crude drafting and the final drafting for you is almost no different. Maybe your mind works like that, that you don't need to structure things, that things just like automatically fall in place and works for you. Fine, good for you. And then you don't have to follow these things. But this video is just meant as a way to think about the different stages of writing, how they overlap, how they interrelate, what purpose they have, and then you choose. And what's also very important is that when you wake up or when you make your time to write, it right, doesn't have to be in the morning, uh, you assess what your energy levels are, uh, what you need to do and what you can do. If you're tired, maybe stick to some drafting, maybe do, but, uh, and not the heavy lifting, not, not the final drafting, maybe just do a little brainstorming, maybe just go back to reading and, and, and updating some stuff, preparing some notes for later, maybe just have some fun and just low-key make sure your bibliography and your reference list is up to date. You know, depending what you are uh, and how you feel and what energy you have, uh, you have different options. You always have something to do. You can always improve your writing process by focusing on different stages at different times. Huh? In the end, you will need to do all of them. But you definitely don't have to do them all in the correct order because there's no such thing because everybody is different. Uh, this is the bibliography, so I'm going to leave that on here. Uh, I borrowed quite heavily from uh, from Kane and the Oxford Essential Guide to Writing, um, and also from from Woods. Uh, so uh, uh, there are also other links uh, below the pages um, that when I uh, when I took some stuff from the internet that I reevaluate and so on. Uh, so you can also find the full text there in the links at the bottom of the slides. Huh? This is going to be it for this topic, and uh, the next video is probably going to be about methodology. Okay, bye.